Good morning, all. A very warm welcome. Um, with I'm just checking where my panelists are, and they are there, so that's good. Uh, very welcome to this um, session on um, Global Alliance for the Security of the Internet of Things. Uh, it has been one of the topics that has been going around um, here at IGF for the last days. And um, what we share, I think, is a, a common understanding of how hairy the problem is, you could say, how hard it will be to come up with solutions, and not the, on the other hand, the urgency to do something about it. So to do that, we have a, first a presentation of a Dutch initiative on uh, the security of the Internet of Things, on digital hard and software security. That will be presented to us by Sandra van der Weyde, my colleague on my left hand, which is right for you. And um, then we have some excellent panelists, will, uh, which I will introduce uh, later on. Uh, they will go into questions, and there will be two questions uh, that will guide the discussion. And I really hope you join in. And the first question would be, what, what concrete policy options can you suggest to improve uh, that would be bring tangible improvements to IoT security. And the second one would be um, what approaches to I IoT security should be avoided, um, given potential negative effects and trade-offs. Uh, I think that one is very important too, because what we don't want to do is to, to stifle innovation, to block access uh, to certain services or content or other negative aspects. And finally, I would like to address the question, and I hope we can get there within the hour that we have gotten, um, of what IGF could do to help promote the right approach to tackling the security of the Internet of Things. But first, I'd like to give the floor to Sandra van der Weyde for a presentation on the roadmap for digital hard and software security. Thank you. speak to today about the Dutch roadmap hardware and software security. I would like to start with an animation. This animation will take you through the outline and guiding principles of our roadmap. I will tell you more about our roadmap and our approach in my presentation. We don't see it on the screen. <coughs> A classic case of the wrong generation trying to play with modern technology. Oh. <laughs> we have Mr. Okay, White, you generation. See, yes. It's a generational <laughs> thing.
you can hear it on your earphones. And maybe this will help you. Yes. More and more things are connected to the internet. In Europe alone, we are talking billions of devices, from smart thermostats to washing machines, from light switches to entire production lines, and from medical equipment to robots in distribution centers. Welcome to the Internet of Things, wonderful new technology that can make our life and work easier and more efficient. But there are also risks involved. Devices can be hacked to steal data, to disturb business processes, or to attack other people's computers. To address these threats, we have devised the Roadmap for Digital Hard and Software Security. This roadmap is a work in progress, and we cordially invite you to participate. How do we develop solutions that protect our security not only today, but also in the future? We have already taken the first step by formulating five future-proof principles to test solutions. One, from design to installation, digital security concerns all phases of the product lifecycle. Two, providers, users, governments, and others, all stakeholders must be on board. Three, strike the right balance. Freedom of innovation can by too much focus on security. Four, different types of prevention, detection, and mitigation measures are needed. Think about monitoring, research, and standards and certification. Five, leave room for an additional approach. The first step has been taken, but we're not there yet. We will continue to develop and implement these measures, preferably also internationally. Join us. As was shown in the animation, more and more devices are connected to the internet. Expectations are that 20.4 billion devices will be part of the so-called Internet of Things in 2020. It is not an easy task to promote the security of all those devices. The Internet of Things environment is complex. Um, let me illustrate this point with a small example. The smart washing machine at my home. Um, as you can see on the screen, a lot of components are involved to do my laundry on a distance. My washing machine is connected to Wi-Fi and thereby connected to the cloud. Also, my smartphone is connected to the cloud. Through the cloud, I can tell my smart washing machine to start the laundry. But just pushing the button in the app on my smartphone. This is really easy to use. Though, in all components, vulnerabilities could appear in my smart washing machine, in the cloud, in my smartphone, and yes, also everywhere in between. And this is just my smart washing machine. Think of how this works for 20.4 billion devices. What would that do? to the measures that are needed. And if you saw this was not complex enough, imagine that this smart washing machine at my home is moved to a hospital, a power plant, or a military facility. What would that do to the measures that are needed? With this complexity in mind, we have formulated five principles for a roadmap as was also shown in the animation. Uh, the first principle is the so-called product lifecycle approach. Roughly speaking, there are three stages for every product. First, the preview stage, green on the figure on the screen. In this stage, a product developer, for example, designs my smart washing machine. Second, the use stage, blue on the figure on the screen. In this stage, the smart washing machine is at my home. As you can see on the screen, in this stage, there's also a little life cycle. If I, for instance, update the software of my smart washing machine, this update... The last stage is the disposal replacement stage, red. 
In this case, I, for example, replace my smart washing machine for a new one. It is important to keep all stages in mind when thinking about the measures we take. To illustrate, if a designer never thought about the possibilities of vulnerabilities in a huge stage, it would be really difficult, if not impossible, to update the software of my smart washing machine. Um, the second principle is the joint responsibility. Not only the government has a role to play to keep our products secure. More parties play or should play an important role in this matter. Although these parties are very diverse in nature, from multinationals to consumers, and also the kind of responsibility is often determined by the context, uh, are we talking about a business to business or a business to consumer relation, in general, four distinctions can be drawn here. First, the providers, manufacturers and retailers. They are mainly responsible for the digital security of the products they offer. Second, the users, variating from consumers to SMAs to multinationals. They can create a higher demand for secure products. For example, if we decide today in this room to go to the local shop, and ask for secure smart washing machines with software updates for 10 years. And better, we would also ask our family and friends to join us. We would give an enormous push to providers to develop this kind of products. Also, users have a responsibility to keep their products secure. However, this is easier said than done. Also, when I look at myself, for example, my first reaction when I see a software update is, uh, if I'm quite honest here, not to install it straight away, but to swipe it away because I want to finish the YouTube movie I watch. So, in a split second I made this decision, I didn't think about the longer term effects, such as that my smartphone is easier to access and thereby also my personal information, or that my smartphone will be used for a DDoS attack to disrupt business operations. So, for the effectiveness of the measures we take, it is important to keep this so-called limited rationality of users in mind. Third, the government. Also, the government can stimulate the demand for secure products. And the government is responsible for upholding public values. Fourth, other parties such as consumer organizations and scientists. They can also contribute to the security of our products. The third principle is balance the public interests. A dynamic balance between security, freedom and economic growth is needed when promoting digital hardware and software security. It is not easy to find this balance, as is shown in the conceptual framework on the screen. This framework shows the difference between the dilemmas behind balancing between security, freedom, and economic growth. To illustrate one dilemma, take for example the ethical dimension. Should the software of my smart washing machine make the decision whether the software of my smart washing machine is installed straight away? Or should I always be in the final control to make this decision? We find it essential to make this kind of trade-offs more visible, to discuss this with stakeholders, and to find the balance in the set of measures that we take. In the case you want to, to learn more about this conceptual framework, um, you can always give Joost or me a call because we also provide workshops. On um, the fourth principle is the portfolio approach. A broad spectrum of instruments is needed for the cybersecurity. Only liability will not work, and only minimum requirements for products will also do not the trick, as vulnerabilities could appear in every stage of the product life cycle. Therefore, prevention, detection, and mitigation measures are needed. Prevention measures, such as stationary requirements to keep non-secure products from the market. Detection measures, such as testing for digital security, to detect vulnerabilities throughout the product life cycle, and mitigation measures as liability law to claim the damages caused by unsecured products. 
This brings me to the fifth and last principle of our roadmap, room for a complementary approach. Our roadmap leads the way to increase the, the security of hardware and software. It offers nine building blocks, nine measures that are needed to promote this security. First, standard and certification. We support the swift adoption of mandatory certification for sp specific product groups and on the longer term, uh, the expansion of all that to all products with internet connectivity. Second, monitoring digital security. In public-private partnership, we aim to develop, if possible at international scale, so I hope you will join us, a monitoring mechanism to share information on the security of the products. Third, cleaning up infected products. Here we seek to exploit the options for internet service providers to combat unsecure UT devices. Four, testing for digital security. We work on a cross-sectoral cybersecurity testbed. Five, cybersecurity research. Uh, amongst others, this research stimulates innovative solutions for unsecure products. Six, liability. Uh, amongst others, the Netherlands is an active participant in the EU Liability and New Technologies Expert Group. Seven, stationary requirements, supervision and enforcement. The Dutch government is investigating how under the European Radio Equipment Directive, minimum security requirements can be set for specific UT devices. Eight, awareness campaigns and empowerment. These will be organized in coordination with the launch of our EUT policy initiatives to support their adoption and to increase their impact. Nine, national government procurement policies. In the Netherlands, the government is the largest buyer of ECT products and services. To use this power for the public good, uh, we will investigate which additional measures for hard and software security can be set in its procurement policies. However, besides these nine building blocks, complementary requirements will still be required, if not already taken. One of the reasons for this is that each domain and each sector has its own risks. This roadmap therefore leaves room for additional measures. Also, this roadmap is work in progress. We will continue to develop and implement it along with relevant stakeholders, and I hope you will also join our road trip. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sandra, for clearly outlining um, what the roadmap is about. It's more about an approach than a, about a program, uh, yet it should yield eventually a program with concrete measures. And that's what we're here for, and that's what we'd like to discuss with our panelists also. Um, from right to left for you, we, there's Mr. Byron Holland from Canada. He is President and CEO of the Canadian Internet Registration Authority. Um, and this is the Canadian country code top level domain registry. Uh, he's also one of the key voices advocating, advocating Canada's interests in the global internet environment. Uh, then, Mr. Martin Botterman uh, from the Netherlands, also from the Netherlands, I might say, uh, Director of ICANN and consultant uh, for the Global Network Knowledge Society and also chair of the Dynamic Coalition on IoT from the IGF. You may have met him in the session yesterday. Um, then we see Mr. Jasper Panza from the UK. He is assistant director at the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sports uh, and one of the driving forces behind the Code of Practice for Consumer IoT Security. Uh, uh, which he will uh, tell you a bit more about uh, shortly. So, um, I wonder what would be the best order to pick, but let's just start at the right. And um, um, I, I, I would like to put these two questions in combination on the table for you. On the on one hand, what would be feasible policy options? On the other hand, harder roads we shouldn't take to stick to the roadmap metaphor. Uh, if you have a short statement on that, that would be very welcome. And 
If you feel, if one of the panelists while speaking is uh, saying something that, that you should react to, don't hesitate and raise your hand. So we are not blocking this and you have to wait till five minutes before the end of the session before you can make your intervention. Do it straight away. And in the meantime, I will be the timekeeper. So don't get angry at me if I shut you up. It's for the common good. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Byron Holland. I'm president and CEO of CIRA. We're the organization that operates the uh, CCTLD for Canada. So most people know us uh, for the domain names that end with .ca, but probably the biggest part of the work that we do, and certainly I think the most critical, is operating the underlying DNS, or domain name system infrastructure that supports .ca. So we have a large network of nodes around the world, or all across Canada, but also around the world. And that's the perspective from which I think about IoT and IoT security in specific, because as many of you will remember, back in 2016, there was a, a, an attack on a, on a large and sophisticated provider of DNS services, a company called Dyn, which took out much of the internet across the North American Eastern Seaboard and some of the largest sites uh, on the internet, CNN, Twitter, sites of that, of that size and scale. And that was a result of the Mirai botnet, which as time unfolded and we, un and we understood more and more about Mirai, essentially that was the first large scale uh, botnet using IoT devices. In particular, cameras seemed to be particularly suspect. But that triggered the kind of DDoS attack that really we'd never seen uh, that scale before. And with the, as, as we heard just in the previous presentation, essentially the exponential increase in devices, IoT primarily devices, that are going to be uh, connected to the Internet in the coming years, that sort of attack has the potential to be more and more prevalent. And certainly maximum attacks an hour at about 1.2 terabytes per second there really is no infrastructure that can withstand a sustained and direct attack. No infrastructure. The biggest and the best of us cannot withstand that. We basically roll over and die and hope it ends soon. I mean, not to be too dramatic, but that's the scale of attacks that are being enabled by IoT devices. So. It's very critical to the operator community and the technical community um, that we have good security on IoT devices because it's very real. In Canada, um, I, I think there's some good news here in that we really started to bring together a multi-stakeholder community because, of course, I have my interests that I've just shared with you, but there are many other communities that also have interests around how do we improve security uh, in IoT devices going forward. And earlier this spring, a number of stakeholders came together to kick off a multi-stakeholder process to try and develop standards around IoT security and, you know, create sort of the ultimate goal being to make security a pillar of the connected future that we're all going to share online with all of the IoT devices that are coming. And that group was comprised or was facilitated and coordinated by ISOC North America, who I think took a really good leadership role here. Uh, my organization's part of it. Uh, certainly the Government of Canada is actually a very active member through uh, the Ministry of Innovation, Science and Economic Development, who holds this file. Canadian Internet Policy and Public Interest Clinic, Legal Clinic, uh, Canary, the main um, research network and education network for Canada as well as over 90 other participants from across uh, what I would call the sectors of a multi-stakeholder world, civil society, academia, uh, government, private sector, and so on. And essentially what's happened is that group has come together to wrestle with these issues, and we've divided ourselves into effectively three working groups. And I was encouraged to see that I think we're probably on the, on the right track because we share many of the same ideas and issues that uh, we just heard about in, in the previous presentation from, from the Dutch government. But we've broken it down into essentially three uh, working groups. Uh, the first around consumer education, and that working group is focused on how do you educate Canadians? 
because it's one thing for us in this room who are interested and have some expertise, but how do we take it to the average end user who has no interest and maybe very limited skills and ensure that they're safe? Because quite frankly, they're the ones who have to be practicing safe computing for the network uh, to be safe. And how do we create that shared responsibility environment in a way that's accessible to the end user or very easy to use? That's actually being spearheaded by Consumer and Corporate Affairs, uh, another government department in Canada. So the government's very involved, but it's very much a multi-stakeholder process. The other uh, element is labeling, and this group's concerned with the labeling regime for devices. So we think of it as, uh, you know, think about nutrition or uh, safety standards. Those kinds of labeling regimes are the type of thing that are providing a model for how would we do labeling uh, for IoT. And that's a very live and active discussion. In fact, just this morning I heard there's some changes afoot on how they uh, might be approaching that in Canada. And one group in particular, the Canadian Standards Association, who's just one of many participants in that group, um, they're the group that does labeling standards for most things in Canada, whether it's like heavy equipment, construction, industrial processes, uh, right down to sort of the quintessential Canadian thing, hockey helmets. I mean, you cannot buy a hockey helmet in Canada if it does not have a CSA stamp of approval on it. So that group is really struggling with how do you do labeling, and especially how do you do labeling in a very uh, fast-moving and an evolving space that needs uh, software updates, presumably on a regular basis. The, uh, the third and final group is around network resilience, and this is more the technical group, technical operators, and it's responsible for recommendations for network level defenses and actions that ISPs or network managers of various stripes uh, can take to reduce their risks. And one of the central things that they're working on that I think has universal applicability is um, something that is like a home gateway. So one of the challenges is, if you think about the, the, the multiplication of devices in a home, whether it's your fridge or your toaster or your thermostat or whatever, let alone all your actual devices, iPads and such, every one of them is a security risk. So the idea of a home gateway is essentially a moat protection with a single drawbridge out to the world. And all your devices are hidden behind that one secure infrastructure significantly reducing the risk of having so many independent devices uh, that can pose potential risk. And this is based on uh, an Internet Engineering Task Force spec known as the Manufacturer Usage Description or a MUD profile. And essentially what this does is use the IETF spec to create this moat and drawbridge single point of authentication to the Internet. So it essentially all your devices behind it white label um, the IP address and are only allowed to speak to that. So that means the likelihood of your IoT doorbell somehow getting compromised by a botnet is significantly reduced because it's behind this uh, secure gateway. So that's one of the uh, things that the Network Resilience Working Group is working on. So maybe I'll just leave it there. I wanted to give you a flavor of what's happening in, in Canada. And I'm encouraged to see that it was similar in nature to some of what we've seen in the Dutch document. Thanks. So three clear pathways. That's already we brought a nine down to three. So that's we've taken the right direction. <laughs> Marta, could you? Yes, fine. I just wanted to challenge the idea that we don't have ways to protect websites. I mean, you're, you're right if you say one website is going to be knocked offline by a terabit attack. But I work for Cloudflare, and we protect 12 million websites. And if you sign up for our free service, <laughs> your, da your data will be put in 155 different places, and nobody will be able to knock you off. I mean, this is, this is the approach that people are taking, because as you say, one site is, is vulnerable. If you're spread out, you're a much broader attack surface. And we have a 20 terabit network. That's adequate to deal with the biggest, net, uh, biggest attacks. Okay, very well timed pitch. Thank you for that.
Maarten. Yes, thank you. Uh, be nice if I put all my devices in the, the cloud for your network. I don't have to worry anymore. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so basically, uh, what's clear here? is that there's multiple tracks that you need to pay attention to. It's the technical innovation track, it's the deployment track, it's uh, how we deal with it in terms of awareness, and how we work together to make things work, uh, example just given. And uh, all these tracks have their life course. What we see at the moment is that the technical innovation track is the one that is moving so enormously fast that uh, f new things come on the market all the time. And uh, that's interesting and, and useful because there's so much challenges in the world that we need to tackle and there's so much more nice things that we can do or, or, or make money with. So one of the things that uh, we can do to make sure that this is developing in a way that is sustainable in the long run is to slowly move away from the model where uh, time to market was the determining factor of what would be the next uh, dominating uh, technology uh, or, or gadget. Uh, but to really move towards an awareness that uh, these developments need to take place in an ethical way. Uh, I've been working with the Dynamic Coalition on Internet of Things for, for, for several years and at global level we find that the where things come together is the need for a good practice starting being being ethical by the outset which uh, is important to consider on a global level because we talk about the global technology and uh, whereas you may have uh, your tools within one country being certified or labeled within maybe even uh, regulation uh, of that country uh, there will always be tools coming from the outside beside the things that we can make ourselves if, if, if we know a little bit more about the tech bits. Uh, but by being ethical by the outset, what is meant with that? It's meant that uh, you actually take the, the human as the, the, the focal point, that you're aware that what we do is to be used by humans and, and uh, basically uh, you should be willing to give it to your children too. Um, Practically, it means that you need to look into things as a meaningful transparency of anything we offer, also in the Internet of Things. Uh, meaningful transparency means not giving all data out there, but is to communicate in, in terms that uh, the user at a certain level uh, understand. Uh, the second uh, thing is to uh, also allow uh, control and uh, particularly of uh, personal data or other things that are done, clear choices to be uh, part of that. And the third thing is uh, indeed, and that's been the emphasis of the, the platforms that have been here, because that was the big lacking point, security. Basic security is what we need to get anything up to a standard that we can make agreements on what we want or don't want with it. If we don't ensure that there is basic security, it won't happen. And, and privacy by outset. These are the points the Dynamic Coalition is pushing for. Um, I think uh, the life cycle approach that has been uh, demonstrated here is, is essential in the thinking of that. I think also the joint responsibility is, is essential. Uh, let's not dump all the, the responsibility on safe use to the end user, but let's make sure that uh, cloud providers, access providers, application providers do their thing in there and I think uh, that awareness is coming up as well. So the frameworks that are developing as demonstrated in the Netherlands where it's really building up from the bottom where you see that uh, there's a multi-stakeholder approach in Canada and where we'll hear about the, 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 the view of the Department of uh, Digital Culture, Media and Sport of the UK on, on how to, to contain this. Uh, it all comes together, but it's all about the same thing. Let's make sure that we can make best use of these technologies, welcome them because we need them and we can have fun with them, but let's make sure that we do it in a responsible way. Thank you so much. A very clear statement on the, the importance of a human-centered approach, um, uh, and which goes also wider than you could say the technical security in itself. Uh, I'd like to hand over to Jesper and we'll
put on the, you had one slide, um, and please explain us what we. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I, I have an academic background, so I'd actually like to structure my answer in response <coughs> to the exam question that you said. What, which policy options should we be pursuing in order to tackle the challenge of, of insecure um, IoT? And um, I think the answer is, is all of them. All of the, all of the options that we have um, available to us have a role to play. Guidance, regulation, certification, standards. And, and, and in the UK, we are pursuing all of them. But, um, but my overall message or my overall um, conclusion would be that we need, to, we need to focus on the basics. We need to make sure that we get the basics right and also move forward swiftly. There's so many devices that are already within our homes, which may be insecure. So many devices that are on the market today, which you can buy that they have default passwords, that their software is never updated, and, and we need to move swiftly in this area. Um, so so let, me, let me talk about um, good practice, regulation, and, and uh, certification in a bit more detail. Um, so I think at the beginning, it is important to set out what good looks like in, in IoT security. This is, the, this is the basic. You need to know what good looks like in order to develop regulatory options, in order to develop um, certification schemes, because even with certification, you need to test against the baseline. You need to test against some uh, kind of standard. Um, when, you, when you try to define what good looks like, um, it is also important to, to uh, do this in the process um, with the stakeholders. So you need to do this with industry, you need to do it with society, consume, consumer associations and academia um, in order to develop this consensus across your stakeholders. Um, um, and we, in the UK we have done that. So um, uh, this is my um, opportunity just to um, talk to you through briefly what we have done over the last few months. Maybe there is a way to make the slide bigger uh, because I, I realize there is a lot of text in there. Um, but what we have done... But I, I'll, um, let me talk you through what we've done. So <laughs> we <laughs> maybe that was a mistake. Which is <laughs> so in our effort to um, to set out what good looks like, we about 18 months ago we have started the process of bringing all the stakeholders together, um, uh, which has then. Um, uh, culminated in the code of practice, uh, which you hopefully will see on the screen in a little while again. Um, uh, we published it in October um, uh, uh, this year, so just a month ago. Um, what the code of practice is doing, and I've got a few copies with me if you'd like to pick one up, um, it sets out in um, 13 high-level outcome-focused guidelines um, what, what good looks like. It brings together the most important um, uh, insights and, and guidelines in IoT security. Um, we published it in eight different languages. Um, so um, maybe there's one uh, um, for you. Um, and um, it is a code that is for uh, the manufacturers primarily of, of IoT devices and also software developers. Um, excellent, thank you very much. So, um, so we published it in October, it's for manufacturers. Um, um, the, the top three guidelines are no default passwords, um, implement a vulnerability disclosure policy in order to help, help security researchers report problems and, and, and vulnerabilities, and that they keep software up to date. Um, We, so we published this. Um, we will be also developing this into a global standard through ETSI, the European Telecoms uh, Standardization Institute. And we heard from Sandra that standard development is important. And we, I, I welcome you to join us in this process. We hope to finish um, the standard development in January or February next year. So it's a relatively swift process. In the UK, we have, when we published um, the code, we have engaged with industry 
and um, we have invited pledges from manufacturers of IoT to implement the code. And I'm pleased to say that two um, a large industry organizations have pledged to implement, that which is HP and Centrica Hive, who produce smart thermostats and similar devices. And in the UK, we'll continue um, uh, going down the route and invite industry pledges. Um, right. I think this is what I this is what we've done in this first bucket of setting out what it looks like. I see a hand up, up to challenge. Yes. I'm Jan Willem. I'm a software developer from the Netherlands. Um, just a quick question. It's about keeping software up to date, but um, how do you deal with deprecation of the hardware device? You cannot keep a uh, device supported for like maybe 20 years, keeping the software up to date with the latest security standards. Sometimes you have to like make a law that you need to keep software up to date for 10 years, or somehow enforce users to update to a newer device. We need to take a life cycle approach to this, right? So, and I agree with Sandra, who, who said as well that um, there's different stages of the life cycle. You need to think about security in the development phase, in the phase when the, con when the product is being used, and at the end when the device is being disposed of. All products have a life cycle and have an end of life. So at some stage, the device will be disposed of or will be handed over to another user. So when it comes to software updates, I think the important thing here is transparency, is to make it clear to the consumer when they go to the shop when they buy a product so that they know for how long the device is being supported with security updates. At the moment, it is, it is, it is very hard to find out for how long um, your internet connected um, security command will receive the software updates. It may only be one year or two years, um, but what happens, um, what happens afterwards? Um, um, then it's, it needs to be clear for the consumer. If, if I look at the Dutch roadmap uh, that was just outlined, there are elements in there that might help here. So w one other thing is the gateway approach that uh, also um, uh, Canada uh, demonstrated or, t or told more about. The, the other one is the, the clarity and consumer information. And a third element would be uh, whether you can disconnect your appliance and it would still function. So at some time, point in time, you can decide, okay, I still want to do my washing with this machine because it's excellent but it's no longer safe, but I can disconnect it and it will still have its basic core functions. Um, and it still has to be played out. There's no definite ans answer yet, but it's definitely a, a problem because the life cycle of appliances, hardware is longer than software may expect. I see two, three hands. I'll move from back to four, front if you uh, will. Yes? Um, Fyodor Leshnevska from University College London. Um, I'm often when everybody speaks, there's this uh, ideal user and the ideal story of the ideal user. Uh, and in a life cycle approach, say a washing machine gets uh, put on free cycle, which is one form on, uh, in the UK, and somebody picks up that machine and then they start using it. And then you no longer can track uh, the user in the same way or if you're not the owner of the machine you're <coughs> you rent the house or uh, so you don't own that machine uh, you don't control the heating in that particular building uh, house or whatever because you're not the owner of the building you, you rent it and or you're in a hospital so there's all sorts of different scenarios uh, which are much more complex and I think when you look at, at the modeling um, you need to factor in a lot more complexity of different scenarios. Yeah, thank you. I think we all agree. Um, uh, we're talking about a kind of, you know, we're, we're still talking about the basics here. Um, and we have to find out how to deal with it in different scenarios. And within the roadmap, there's room for this additional approach, but it's like a, an escape, an emergency escape. We can always say, oh, yes, this is part of the additional approach because here this machine is in hospital or whatever, or here we find a different user arrangement. Right, if I bring us back to, to, um, to my uh, attempt to address the exam question. So that was the first part of setting up what it looks like. Um, let me say a few words about regulation and certification. Um, when it comes to, I think regulation has a role to play. I think regulation here gives us an opportunity to eradicate the, the worst practice that we're seeing at the moment, is to get rid of devices that 
are being sold at the moment with default passwords that you can look up on the internet. And so you get rid of devices where, that are being solved and that are being sold with, um, with vulnerable software that are known and that are very easy to be exploited. So we are in the UK, we are looking at options. It is difficult to, to get it right. You don't want to cause unintended consequences such as stifling innovation. Um, um, but but there is, there's a role to play, and we're happy to work with, with other governments in this area um, to, to align our approach. Thirdly, on certification, I think, I think there's a role for certification as well. Um, um, there's three elements to certification. One is the baseline, one is the way of, of, of doing the assurance, and thirdly, there's, there's a way of communicating the outcome of the assurance to the consumer via a, a kite mark, via a certificate, or via a, a label. Um, it's, it's, again, it's hard to get it right. Even if you just look at consumer IoT, the market is so diverse. And what may be appropriate in terms of securing a connected door lock may not be appropriate to, uh, to securing a connected light bulb. So setting, setting the baselines and developing a certification scheme that, is, that, is set, that needs to apply to, to the broad diverse range of devices that we have, again, is, is, is a challenge. And how do you test consistently across all those devices? Um, but um, you know, we have something we, we are beginning to look into as well. Um, so I leave it here. These are kind of my 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 view on, on kind of the three things that that are most important. But I'm, again, I'm keen to hear from you. I thank you for the questions that have already come in. And I think with looking back to to the presentation that, that Sandra presented, I think we are already aligned. I think we will place the emphasis slightly differently. But I think there is there is a lot of um, overlap already. Thank you. I go, I go back to the two questions that are still hovering around the room. Yes, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Walter Natwis. Um, we've been seeing from the example given by the gentleman from, from Canada that, that the rumor was that certain entities on the internet were flexing their muscles just to see what was possible to do with these mega, mega attacks. And then they sort of died away again, apparently, because they're less in the news at this point in time. Yesterday, Ambassador Martinez of France said in the cybersecurity session, if something really goes wrong, there's only one party that all the people will knock on the door of, and that will be the government and nobody else. They won't go to the internet provider or the domain name host or whoever is involved. They will go to the government and say, why didn't you fix this in time? So there are so many fixes already that have been developed but somehow do not get implemented for whatever sort of reasons. The IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, was mentioned. I did a session with them on reach out, on the work they do. So how come that these sort of fixes are not implemented in time by industry? Often you can see that there are some very perverse incentives not to do so because simply they make more money by not doing it. But if it, it's an obligatory something in the end, then they will, everybody will have to do it to create a level playing field. And who has to be the leading role to get that discussion going? And again, I think we can all look at the government to take that leading role because the industry probably will never do it because why is the incentive to do that if there's no regulation, there's no incentive? So, and I will end up with an, with a, uh, an, an um, example that was provided by the automotive industry recently, by the car builders, then something came up that they would have to update all the systems, about 117 in new cars, ICT systems, that they would have to update them for at least seven years and be responsible for that update from whoever manufactured the software. And they just said, then we're going to make cars that will run no longer than seven years. And then I thought, who can afford to drive cars that will only be around for seven years? 50% of the population probably can't, and I'm not speaking about Eastern Europe, where they move to next, and then for the next 20 years to Africa, where you can see Peugeot's built in the 70s and 60s driving around. So in other words, that is not a sustainable model. And that is an, ex an example where I think things will go wrong if there's no sustainable model created by somebody and again, I say the government. <coughs> Hi, um, my name. <laughs> Hi, so my name's uh, Taylor Bentley. I'm with the Government of Canada. So I lead ICED, um, ICED's participation on the planning committee, and or I 
I support my director general who's on the planning committee. I also lead the Government of Canada coordination on this. So, you know, happy to say that we have at least 12 different uh, departments and agencies involved. So, um, to your point, um, yes, thankfully we have not had life-threatening instances of attacks. Uh, if we had, uh, then there would be several post-market mechanisms in which governments could levy on these type of manufacturers, right? Uh, consumer safety acts, there's, uh, you know, deceptive marketing practices. But the time is getting <laughs> rather long on this, right? So the, uh, basically, the, the clock is ticking. Um, you're right, the incentives um, for some manufacturers are not quite aligned, especially ones that are not within our borders. Um, but what we do is we, we bring them into our initiative and we say, listen, the clock is ticking and we need to pre preempt the need for any kind of um, responsive action. Because you're right, if that instance happens, um, you know, it will go to the highest political level and you'll get a reactionary response and I don't think that's best for anyone. That's not sustainable. So we need to do the work now with everyone on board and in a multi-stakeholder approach, the beauty is engagement and buy-in, right? And you're talking to everyone who would be responsible for implementing. Um, so we definitely welcome your, your, your comments on what would, would work as a sustainable option that seems like it hits this right balance um, of, of all the different, because you're right, there are lots out there. Um, the key is having this conversation about what works in the long term and what ultimately preempts the need for, for a, a heavier handed approach. And that's the priority of the Government of Canada. So thank you very much. I'm Mike Nelson with Cloudflare, and I wanted to pick up on a couple of really important points that I heard Sandra make and Martin make. You, you, you both said, you know, we've got to have new approaches, and we've got to realize it's not just about fixing the thing. It's about building security into the network. But unfortunately, this, this slogan, every device updatable, no default passwords, runs against that, unless you're thinking about the whole system. We have the potential not to build an internet of secure things, which is impractical and impossible and very expensive, but a secure cloud of things where the gateway is where the security is added, the gateway is where the updates are done, and the gateway is where the flexibility is done. You don't want to do that for pacemakers and airplanes and tanks, but if I've got a 40 cent sensor, I want that as simple as can be, and I want it connecting to a gateway. There, there, again, using our own company, there's a, a Wired magazine article on Cloudflare's approach. Other companies are doing the same thing, and it's much cheaper, much more flexible, and it gets us away from this one-size-fits-all, every device updatable, which is actually going to eliminate some very exciting opportunities if we require everything to be 5 euros or 10 euros. Uh, thank you. I think the gateway approach was already mentioned. Uh, Martin, you're there, but there's still one question in the room. So I'd like to go there first, and then you get the floor. My name is Kostin Boerman. I'm also a software developer from the Netherlands. Um, I would like to continue on the last sheet with the 13 uh, best practices uh, for IoT devices. And these points have already been best practices inside the software industry. The reason that they are not being used in, for example, some IoT devices or other solutions um, can be related to company culture, to time constraints, to money constraints, or other things. And I think that if we want to enforce or at least continue with these best, best practices, that will require a change of culture. And are there any ideas on how this would be possible because uh, s especially small companies are not going to invest in all those 13 points, even when they are best practices. Well, I think that might be an excellent um, step up to rounding off this discussion. Uh, Martin, you wanted to react, then I'll go to Byron and then to Jasper. And to Sandra, if you like to. 
Um, and also, please take into account what was my last question initially, whether there would be an active role for IGF in making all these suggestions about what to do and what not to do uh, work, or at least spread. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you for that question. I'll leave it to Jasper to respond to. Uh, more widely on uh, uh, the point also that, that Mike made. Of course, we cannot just secure the devices, but what we need to have for devices is some standards. That's clear. Uh, they're not there yet. They're under development. And standards only make sense if they can then inform choice. So you need to have some kind of certification and labeling to, so people can know what it is. Uh, just, it hasn't been mentioned, but the core of the Canadian project, which I like so much, is the aim is to get consumers to make smarter choices. So they get better information, they're more aware of how they should make those choices. And in that way, leading the market, which for the IoT consumer, uh, IoT uh, seems to be a very appropriate way forward. Uh, that you cannot rely on the safety of the devices alone. Uh, I'm 100% with you. And, and just make sure you don't mis misunderstand uh, Mike. He didn't say, just secure the gateways and you're done. I mean, that's old security thinking. We secure the front door and once you're in, you can do whatever you want. With some devices, like your electronic toothbrush, that's not that much a problem. With other devices, like a pacemaker, it is. Uh, so uh, that's also uh, that part. Now, the role of IGF, I would say don't wait for the IGF. And don't wait for Berlin to happen. But continue doing your thing in, in, in contributing to, to what we're doing here. And next year at IGF, let's compare notes again and see where we got, what the issues remaining are. And I think uh, that's the best uh, added value uh, this place can offer. Thanks, Mayor. We'll just pick up on the last point, the IGF, and, and I would agree with Martin. Don't don't wait for the next one. Um, you go back to whatever uh, environment you're from and continue to work on on these issues. And you've heard some examples and stories and contrasting points, which I think we can all learn from. And I think that really, to some degree, is the value of the IGF: is the ability to come and participate in the kinds of conversations that we have here with people who are doing different things in uh, different jurisdictions that perhaps can be applied. But I do, when I listen to, in this case, three different countries' experiences, um, they do share a lot of similarities and a lot of, I think, paths that are being marched down at this point. So I think we can already start to see the shape of the future to some degree. Now the question is really, uh, around executing in our respective jurisdictions and cross-cuttingly across the uh, industry. So IGF is a good place for those conversations, but really it's about going back home and implementing them in a way that's consistent with uh, your jurisdiction's requirements while recognizing that this is a cross-cutting technology across silos and across countries so how do we make sure that we make good, consistent decisions uh, across all those jurisdictions? And I think that's one of the great challenges of this space. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jesper, please be short, otherwise people will think the next session has started. Sure, I, I agree um, with the previous speakers on the role of the IGF. We need to move forward. We cannot wait for, for, for the IGF to, um, to make much progress. We need to move forward with our own national initiatives in the meantime and coordinate. On the 13 points, Yes, they're already um, common practice in IT, but in IoT they are not. So we hope with setting those out, we can move the conversation forward from what it looks like to actually towards implementation. And we want those to inform um, all the relevant initiatives that are happening to improve IoT security. Okay, thank you all for your attention and your contributions. Thanks to all the panelists. Thanks to Daphne and Arnold assisting in reporting and the online conversation. And um, with that, I would like to conclude this session. Thanks. Thank